In the uh, last segment, we heard from several members of lesbian and gay youth of Toronto. The most difficult time for a gay teenager, high school. The peer pressure to be, quote, normal is, is overwhelming. The intense bigotry against being a fag is a constant threat, and sometimes it even leads to violence. But times are changing, even in high schools, as we found out. I'm in grade nine right now, and um, I don't get very many hassles from my friends, uh, mostly because uh, the male crowd, the straight male crowd, tries to avoid me at all cost. Um, they seem to think it's a disease or something, and as soon as I go close to them, they'll they'll get it and they'll become homosexual and they'll they'll hate every minute of it. And so, um, but I I have many more friends that are women. Um, I think we have more um, things in common. Um, but there, I do have the, the occasional male friend, and they're supportive. They don't mind. Afraid, I guess they're afraid of their own sexuality because teenagers, like in, in between the periods, I don't know what age to what age, but somewhere in between coming from a child to a, an adult in the teen years, people start wondering about their sexuality, and a lot of people don't explore it, and they just sort of like turn it off. And so, if they're in a high school with another gay person and they've sort of like thought about it they get really offended because that other person knows that, th that he or she is gay and they're comfortable with it and they can't understand that. Because I was openly gay, like, in high school and I was, on all, I was on a lot of sports teams and a lot of my friends knew I was gay and, like, they had no problems with it. You didn't get hassled about it at all? Uh, I, was, I was always a tough kid, so no one would hassle me, I don't think. I think it's easier to be a lesbian because, um, the guys, I don't know, guys would beat up on, like, a gay man in school if they knew he would, if they found out he was gay, call him a faggot and beat him up and stuff like that. The girls will just basically stay away from you, and I'd rather people stay away from me than scar me. <sighs> oh, Lesbian and Gay Youth of Toronto has been excellent for me. It's probably been um, the biggest step forward in my life that I've taken. The reason being is that you first walk in, I, when the first day I walked in was about eight months ago. And I felt, I was, I was terrified. Um, all these people, um, I was afraid there were going to be police at the door or something. And it turns out the first night I came here, I made about five friends. And I still have those friends. And they've been really nice. And, you know, I think that it's an excellent, excellent support group. It's really good. I have a lot of fun here. I've met a lot of other gay kids my own age. And I've enjoyed talking to them and sharing. We go out and have parties. And it's like a it's like a social group for me right now. Dealing with LGYT is a lot easier than dealing with the bar scene and because like in the bars everybody just wants to play head games with you and stuff like that and I think coming out at such a young age it's hard to deal with. It wasn't anything like one-on-one -on -one sort of counseling it was the whole group and like ideas and views of other people that sort of like helped me grow grow up a lot. Just uh, before we go to our phone call, let's just uh, answer the question that I put to you. The, the, a lot of uh, fear for a lot of people is that if you allow homosexuality into your organization, be it a church, or if you acknowledge homosexuality, these people are really immoral. I mean, what you've got to be afraid of is that, that it's just a, a sign because their behavior beyond that is so immoral. These people are so sick and dis and that's a terrible fear that a lot of people have. Well, God forbid they come in the church, they'll ruin it and we'll all fall apart. Well, of course it's balderdash. I mean, look at these guys here. Are these immoral? Uh, we're looking at them. Well, I guess these guys are, but the, most of them are. No, the, the, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. The, the fact is that there's no more imm uh, immorality. There's no more immorality bo in terms of dishonesty in terms of uh, the common th um, crimes of theft and abuse of other people. But then you get down to the crimes that, or the, the, what people are really, the behaviors that people are really afraid of, pedophilia, for example, the exploitation sure. and abuse of young kids. Sure. There's no evidence that there's more among homosexuals than among heterosexuals. I mean, little girls are abused by heterosexual males. We, you know so much about sex abuse and child abuse. It's often a stepfather or a father or an right. uncle against a little girl. Not a little boy. Now, we do have both kinds. But the fact is, conferring uh, a sexual orientation on somebody doesn't either exonerate them or, or label them as being moral or immoral. Mm -hmm. it, it just has, it's an irrelevancy as far as I'm concerned. Now, there's one aspect about it has to do with people say, well, look how promis promiscuous they are. The fact is, if you go to the gay bar and then immediately drive up to one of the heterosexual meat markets, they're very similar. And, they're very, and until, mm -hmm. until AIDS, for that matter, 
there were very similar kinds of exchange of partners and rapid turnover and promiscuity. But the fact is, there's actually, there was, before AIDS, there was a book written on homosexuality. Most of the relationships in homosexuality, just like I said about the, the generalizations from narrow stereotypes, are monogamous and long-standing relationships. What people want, everybody wants to get their rocks off, okay, that's part of sexuality. But the fact is what we really want is long-term meaningful intimate relationships. And you only get that on a one-to-one -one basis. You don't get that by constantly changing partners. And the gay community learns that as quickly as the straight community. All right. We have some phone numbers that we've given out. One for the gay, uh, what's the correct title? Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And the other group is the... Is, is uh, Lesbian and Gay Youth of Toronto's phone line. Thank you. I will get the show. We made to recite the titles, and then at the end of the show, we will give you out the phone number. So if you didn't get them, get your pencil ready by the end of the show. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. You have a question, or you want to make a comment? I wanted to ask a question. Um, something that I've been thinking about for quite a while. I'm 24 years old. Um, I'm frightened as to how to go about ask, or telling my parents that I'm gay, and I wanted to know if, if Dr. Levine had any ideas as to how to go how to go about doing it, or whether it's necessary to even tell them. Is it something that parents need to know? I mean, I wouldn't go and tell them that I'm straight, so why, why do I feel I have to tell what them? What a terrific way to put it, Scott. I wouldn't tell my parents I was straight, so why would I tell my parents I was homosexual? Well, some people don't, in fact, tell their parents. Uh, some people don't ever come out of the closet. Uh, I would say the majority still don't come out of the closet. They fear society's opprobrium, criticism, rejection, ostracism. You guys can talk about that. Not only in high school, I must say, in college and in various professions, to, to tell people that this is my sexual orientation is to open yourself up to all kinds of vulnerability and criticism and people making fun of you and name calling and derision and mistrust. Invalid, but that's the way it is. Now, my own feeling is a very good question. There is a book on the market. Uh, some of you may have read it. It's, it's an older book. It was written about 15 years ago. It was written by the, the author of a, another book called Gentleman's Agreement, Laura Hobson. I think she just passed away. The book is called Consenting Adult, and it's about her son. It's about her son who, at the age of 19, finally tells his mother and father that he's gay, although he's known for a few years. And as, as is more commonly the case, not always, but most commonly the case, young adult males know in their early teens or their mid-teens by then that they are that their erotic preferences and their masturbatory fantasies and their dreams and their experiences tend to be along one line. It's not just a matter of this or that, I'll take a choice. It's a real strong preference. Just like I have a heterosexual preference, they have a homosexual preference. And in, it, I was interested in what some of the young men said here today. Interestingly, not only for homosexuality, for any kind of terrible crisis that you present to your parents, it is usually the mother that handles it a lot better than the father. It is usually the father for whom it is a much greater threat. Very upsetting, because yeah, uh, it's a threat to their own machismo, their own integrity right, as a human. Right, right. What is my son going to be like? What are people going to say about me? Right. But after a while, of course, and at this again, Scott, will depend on your relationship with your parents and how much of your life, because it has to do with love and mutual respect, uh. that you would like to share with them. You don't have to tell them, as in mandatory, uh, or even morally, but, but it's a question in terms of personal comfort. Yeah. What is the effect that you envision it will have on them Will there be a schism? Will there be rejection? Usually there's not. Usually there takes a while for the shock, because there is a shock, to say it in. After all, you've been living with this for quite a few years. They have to go through it in a relatively short period of time. But after a while, they come together and, and they start appreciating each other as human beings, not as gay or straights, but as human beings. But I suppose the reason you would want to tell your parents is it's difficult to have to keep living a lie, that there's a whole Absolutely. segment of your life that you have to keep pretending about, and that's not, and where were you, where were you, and oh, I was this Absolutely. and that, and that, that must get very tired. Absolutely. But the ba bottom line is if, you're, if it's going to crush your parents or whatever, they can't do it and they'll fall apart, you have to weigh that against and, and try and to keep the balance. Well, one of the things I was going to say, and of course it's wrong, uh, I was going to say that uh, people like Scott, not necessarily you, Scott, uh, will never have a family, will never marry and have kids. Well, the fact is, aside from the, the fact that some homosexual couples have adopted kids in some states, the fact is that many homosexual males bite the dust in the sense that they say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to suppress my homosexuality and I'm going to marry and I'm going to have kids in order to satisfy the world, the neighbors, but especially my parents and the way I was brought up. In reading, they subjugate their uh, own desires. Sure. That is very difficult to do. On that note, we'll take a break. We're back in just a moment.
If you're a teenager who would like some information on homosexuality, you can call the Counseling Center for Lesbians and Gays at 977-2153. Or for more information on lesbian and gay youth of Toronto, you can call the 519 Church Street Community Center at 392-6874. If you are the parent of a gay teenager, how are you coping? What problems have you encountered? Call us at 870-7716.